Now we're uh, we're in Solid Rock Baptist Church, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sussex, New Jersey, New Jersey. But you don't talk like that up here. You talk like regular human beings up here. Joy. Yeah. Now, after all these years, I still have a little bit of a little bit of accent when I go down south. People think, "Oh, you're from up north." I know I'm from up north. So I listen to myself. But uh, let's 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 go ahead and, and get started. I think uh, the videos are running, right, Brother Ed? Mine is. Okay. Let's see. This is running. Yeah. We'll see if we get any people. It says it's live. Oh, there we go. We got our first first viewer. That usually is a good indication. If I start getting numbers, that means somebody out there is watching. Um, but we just looked at the in the last session. We looked at this uh, motor here. It's electric motor. It obviously has a designer, all this has a maker. Uh, now, if I took away any one of those parts, you think that thing would run? Uh, no. Not at all. Okay? No way that could work. Uh, you know, I might be able to uh, jury rig something, but, and even if it would, even if I could get it to work somewhat, it would not work the way it's supposed to. You know, I probably could do maybe do some fan dangling thing, but that would be similar. So there's the designer, there's the maker. If I take any of those parts out of there, I end up with not a motor. It doesn't work. Right? Now, let's, I'm going to show you this video now. Now this is even, now that's pretty complex, right? That, that motor, you know. And, and most of us really can't understand how it really works. You have to, you know, it works, but uh, somebody had to design it makes it work, right? Well, watch this video here. This is in a bacteria. In fact, there is. Oops. No, nope, that is not. That's, let's go back <laughs> that's, the, that's the secret video. That's the next video. In With a diameter of only 40 nanometers, it is composed of protein. What's 40 proteins. nanometers? Two Very tiny. Bacteria rotate its flagellum Tinier than 10 tiny. To 15 That's what 40 nanometers is. To achieve motility. You know, maybe we could turn bacteria a couple of lights off. Bacteria and are composed of about 30 different proteins. First, a protein okay. called Fly F forms a rotor ring in the cell membrane. Fly F self assembles to form the ring, which then becomes the foundation for other proteins to attach, which in turn becomes the foundation for the attachment of others. The self assembly takes place in methodical order through the accurate recognition of appropriate others. With the motor in place as the foundation, the filament that acts as the propeller is then formed of proteins called flagellin. With the help of a capping protein at the tip, flagellin molecules, sent out from the cell body to the central channel of the motor, step up to form a helical tubular structure. The structure, revealed by electron microscopy, was very much like an artificial motor, with its stator, rotor, and bushing and surprised the world. Image analysis of electron micrographs of straight flagellar filaments led to a three-dimensional image near atomic level. The central channel of the filament was extremely small, only two nanometers in diameter. How big is that? That's tinier than tiny. It's <laughs> tiny, tiny. Self-assembly of the flagellum, which grows out of the cell, always occurs at its distal growing end. The component proteins are produced inside of the cell and sent out to the tip through the central channel. The proteins are unfolded for insertion into the channel and then refolded at the distal end. Where then is the export apparatus? 
Research on flagellar protein export had been progressing extremely slowly until recently. All of these experiments have shown that flagellar protein export occurs in the following manner. First, fly eye associates with You're going to get a test on this after, so pay attention. ...to be exported also binds to them. And this ternary protein complex binds to the C-ring and waits for the export gate to become disengaged. No problem, we can build one of these, don't we? When the export yeah. gate is free and available, the ternary protein complex docks to the export gate, together with free fly HI complexes that are floating nearby or attaching to the C-ring. The gate is closed. However, it opens when the fly HI hexamarine complex binds to it and efficiently inserts the amino terminus of the flagellar protein into the gate. Remember, key term, amino terminus. Here, fly H and fly I detach from the export gate through ATP hydrolysis. The export gate utilizes proton motive force to send flagellar proteins into the channel. It unfolds flagellar proteins into long stretched chains for export into the 2 nanometer channel. Once the whole chain is within the channel, it is transported to the distal end of the flagellum. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fly HI complexes that have detached from the export gate bind another flagellar protein and bring it to the waiting circle on the C ring. We how does know to do this? And release There's an intelligence in there that's telling it to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The flagellar proteins exported in this way bind one after another to the distal end. The flagellum becomes longer, and it eventually becomes possible for the bacteria to swim. The rotation of the motor is transmitted to the flagellar filament with a gentle helical structure to generate propulsion. The hook acts as a universal joint, so that the torque can be transmitted regardless of the orientation of the flagellar filament. Bacteria can swim about freely because of this. <coughs> now listen to this, this next part. What is the mechanism here? We're going to talk about mut mutations, and the mutations don't work for the benefit of the... The structure of the hook life. was studied in detail to learn the secret. This is the hook. The hook is a tube of 55 nanometers in length, in which roughly 130 hook protein subunits are bonded together. This is the atomic model of the hook. The model, but that's the what... The D2 domains of the hook the are model. strongly bonded to one another on the hook's surface to form the right-handed, six-stranded helices, much like a spring. And they form a kind of mesh structure with the D1 domains on the inside. This is what brings about the rigidity against torsion. <laughs> While there is a large variation in the length of the flagellar filament, the length of the hook is almost constant at 55 nanometers. Look at the left. There's the mutant Mutants chain. with hooks longer or shorter than 55 nanometers cannot swim properly. Cannot so swim how properly. Then do hooks have the predetermined length of 55 nanometers? The mechanism that determines hook length is as follows. First, Hook protein molecules are efficiently exported, and the hook becomes nearly 55 nanometers in length. The autocatalytic cleavage of flu B slows down the export of hook protein. Then several fly K molecules are exported to measure hook length. In other words, the cleavage of flu B works as a molecular timer that controls the speed of hook protein export. As you can see, the precision mechanisms for constructing biological nanostructures are becoming clarified. Alright, uh, can I get the lights? Now, you saw the little electric motor. Now you saw what God can do in the little bacteria. That's just yeah. imagine the number of bacteria there are in the world. 
or on your body right now, probably. And you can't even see them. You have to even need a microscope. They had to use an electron microscope to see that thing. And it was doing all that stuff automatically. Now, if any one of those parts is wrong, it ain't going to work. Now, that shows to me that there is a designer and there is a baker. And there's no way that that came about. But uh, there's no way that came about by accident right? or by natural selection. Right? Uh, now that one little machine inside a cell, there's hundreds of machines like that in a cell that are working 24-7, okay? In your body, you have maybe a trillion cells. Every cell has things that, the little machines that are doing it, it says, hey, I'm hungry. Hey, I need water. Hey, I need to get rid of wet, waste. Hey, I'm cold, I'm hot. All that intelligence between cells, they can't understand, can't talk about, they can't explain. They might be able to explain a little bit of your nervous central nervous, nervous system and the neurons and that type of thing, but they can't explain. They can't explain why those proteins in the, inside that cell decide, oh, we're going to do this, or we're going to we're going to make this. They say, well, it's DNA. Well, where's the information come from the DNA to do all that? And then there's little stuff floating around. You saw it, little stuff floating around. All the sides. Oh, you know, I need to go over here and form this thing. So just remember this video next time somebody talks to you about natural cell. When Darwin lived, he thought that the single cell was just a protoplasm, just a little piece of gook. They didn't understand the complexity of cell. Every cell in your body is as complex as the universe that we see every night when we look out, okay? Just to give you a comparison. As complex and as big as the universe is, in eternity, as far, and when you get down to small, 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 that's how complex your single cell is. So God is great in eternity, and he's great in uh, small things. Too, All right. Now, now I, I put this in here to show you this. Now, do you think, after seeing that, do you think this little grandbaby came as a result of... Uh, no. She's a machine, she's two years old, she's got a monkey beak at two years old. She understands language, she can almost walk. This is, she's at maybe a year old here, I think. Hannah, say hello. Hannah, say hi. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Understands language, but makes a baby smile. Ever wonder about that? <laughs> Anyway, that's my grandbaby again. You're just going to see her. All right. Don't take a break. That's where we were supposed to take the break before. All right. We're going to go to the next uh, presentation. If we don't get it all done uh, tonight, we're going to talk about what is science. And if we don't get it all done, that's fine. We'll just pick up where we, where we left off. Science in the Bible. Okay. Dr. Carl W. Dean is playing Bright Ministries. This topic is what is science? What is real science? That's what we're going to talk about. Here's the key verse, theme verses, Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Psalms 19, 1 to 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And then here's a warning for us. From the Apostle Paul, or Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and questions of science falsely so called. You see this dust out here and all this right in the middle here? What is what is that called? Remember? Milky Way. Milky Way. You know why it's milky? It's because those are stars out there. That's not dust. And there was a time in our, our science where we thought that uh, there was only one galaxy. And then about the 1920s, I think Mace Hubble discovered a couple more galaxies. And then when Hubble telescope went out there, he saw billions of galaxies. There's a billion stars approximately in every galaxy. Now can you imagine you got a billion galaxies full of billion stars? That's what that's what's out there. And we just found that out recently. You know, we just found that out recently. So we're going to talk about what is science. We're going to talk about the four assumptions when it comes to science. 
We're going to show that not all things are important that are scientific. Not all things, not everything that's important is scientific. We're going to show you what science cannot do. We're going to show you what natural, that natural science, naturalistic science is a philosophy. In other words, naturalistic. They just look at nature. They don't want to have anything supernatural involved with it. And then uh, talk about the research of science. Science. It's derived, derived from the Latin word, uh, I think I left out a couple words here. It's science tia. Science tia. It's Latin. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right. But it's S-C-I-E-N-C-T-I-A. Which means what? Knowledge. That's a synonym here's a big definition according to the Oxford Dictionary, a branch of study which is concerned with either the, a connected body of demonstrated truths or observed facts, systematically classified and more or less colligated, colligated by being brought anyway, on and on. But you're supposed to be looking for truth and you're supposed to look for things that are observed. Discovery of new truth within its own domain. Science is always growing. Science is not the ultimate truth. Here's the Garden of Noah Webster, 1821. In a general sense, knowledge or certain knowledge, the comprehension or understanding of truth or facts by the mind. And look what Noah says in his dictionary. The science of God must be perfect. Okay? So that's what we're looking for. He gives another example. In philosophy, a collection of general principles of leading truths relating to any subject. See, I took a political science class when I was in college. Well, they're trying to make it into a science, but uh, they're trying to find truth, trying to find statistics, trying to make, but the true scientists, they, a true science they usually look at is like math and physics, where you can put it in an equation. Those are the pure sciences. And then off on the sides, on the tape, uh, you know, on, on the periphery, is you have the other, other sciences. And here's some more stuff. Pure science is the mathematics is built on self-evident truths, but the term science also applied to other subjects. Found on generally, on general, generally acknowledged truths as metaphysics or on experiment observation as chemistry and natural philosophy, or even to an assemblage of the general principles of an art as the science of agriculture, the science of navigation. Why did I say all that? Science is, means many things to many people. We're gonna look at the science as truth, right? Science is knowledge. Science according, is according to the Bible. But in the, in the uh, natural world, in the science out there that you, you see on CNN and, uh, and in your publications like Time Magazine, science is always, is always uh, evolving. Science is always, they're always looking for truth. But whenever they come close to the Bible, come to the truth, they go. <laughs> A lot of physics bring you right up to God. And you know what they do? They go this way. Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, okay, right around the time of the Reformation. The father of the scientific method talked about science this way. They came up with the empirical method. In other words, you have an experiment, you look at the observations, you come up with conclusions, okay? This is, this is what he said. There are two books laid before us to study, to prevent us from falling into error. The volume of the scriptures, first the volume of the scriptures, Notice uh, he was a contemporary of King James in the King James Bible. See that? Scriptures, which reveal the will of God, then the volume of the creatures, which express his power. And creatures, he's talking generically, all the things in, that God has created. But you notice, here's the first scientist. He came up with the scientific method, and he says, you got to have the scriptures in one hand, and then you got to have this other image. And then, and then he says, then the volume of the creatures. So you're looking at nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. So you got the scriptures on one hand, keep you from error, and then you observe the universe. Okay, here's Kepler. Johannes Kepler, the founder of the celestial mechanics. I mean, you can't get a better uh, authority than this. One of the greatest, okay? 1571 to 1630. What's he a contemporary of? King James Bible. You see that? See that? Kepler, Tycho Brahe, Copernicus. Copernicus is a little bit earlier. But Tycho Brahe, 
had a system of epic service for the universe, and yet he kept he challenged Kepler, go find it, go find this, how this all works. And so he did. He's a contemporary of King James and the King James Bible. This is what he said. My wish is that I may perceive the God whom I find everywhere in the external world in like manner within me. So he sees God in everything. Mm -hmm. Dr. Henry Morris talks about epic laws. A law is formulated when it is observed, when it is observed that you get the same results from the same experiment, derived from data and processes of the present. Scientific laws are predictive. Darwinianism does not fit in any of those. It's not been observed. It's not predictive. And is it derived from data and processes of the present? No way. No. Dr. Jack Sears says, it's a dynamic enterprise and approach to truth that is ever changing. The truth of science has a habit of changing in time. Now I've got some examples, we may not get to them tonight, but I've got some examples that will show you that science has fallen on its face many, many, many times. All right, there's four basic assumptions in science. Nature is understandable. All nature is subject to the same laws. So if I went to Alpha Centauri, if I went to the, you know, the next galaxy, the laws would be the same. Measurable cause underlies all observable effects. So I can predict, I can do it over and over and over again. If I do the experiment, I should say the same results. And the simplest explanation is the accepted one. There must have been a designer, and there must have been a maker. Not all things are important or scientific since they cannot be duplicated. How about a birth? There's a couple babies running around here, or bouncing around here. A birth is important, but it's not scientific, you know? It, it happens. Signing a declaration of independence is important, but it's not scientific. So if somebody says, well, I only believe in science, well then, you don't enjoy having a baby, you know? Signing. How about graduating from kindergarten? In some schools, that's a big, big deal. And then catching a fish. Like, oh, it just happened. There's a picture of Pensacola you saw in a few before. There's a Spanish mackerel, right? This, this Spanish mackerel just happened, you know, after trillions of years. This Spanish mackerel, remember, remember the bacteria? There's trillions of cells in there. It all has to work right. My boy catches it off the coast of uh, Pensacola. What science cannot do, what science cannot do, it cannot tell you if a coin will be heads or tails. You ever think about that? Probabilities, probabilities, you know, cast them a lot, they did in the Old Testament and New Testament. Can't tell you. Science cannot tell you whether it's going to be heads or tails. It cannot make moral judgments. Science does not tell you whether it's right or wrong. Survival of the fittest certainly doesn't tell you what's right or wrong. Me first, you last. That's Darwinianism, right? Is that a moral judgment? I it cannot tell you how to use the knowledge you gain. So some people uh, use a gun to go hunting, and some people use a gun to go kill people. It can't make aesthetic judgments. Now this is, I put that in there. Uh, you know, is that, is, this, uh, is that art good or is it bad? Do I like this? Is this pretty? Is this ugly? That sounds nice. That sounds bad. Can't make those kind of judgments. It can't draw conclusions about the supernatural. It's a super, if it's, by definition, if it's supernatural, it's outside the natural. So I can't experiment with it. Yeah. I know it's there because it's outside. It's outside the natural. Because the only way to explain what's happening in the natural is it's something supernatural. In other words, all the miracles in the Bible, they were miracles. They were supernatural. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you can't reproduce them other than if you're doing a miracle. It's supernatural. Okay? And it cannot be consistent with truth cannot be considered the ultimate truth. You see something in science in the textbook, it's not the ultimate truth. Brother Ed and I were talking about when, the, when they were landing on the moon, the first landings on the moon, yep. uh, they were expecting those, those spacecraft to sink in about 100 feet of dust. I don't know, I'm making it up. Maybe, maybe 20 feet of dust. Because the moon is so many millions and billions of years old, and there must have been dust on there, right? So it goes in there. Uh, 
That's why all the landers, if you notice, they have these pads on them, pretty large, significant pads. That was because they were afraid they were going to win us. You know how much dust there was when they went in there? So it's not the ultimate truth. I remember textbooks saying, you know, there's so many planets in the solar system, and now they're finding all kinds of stuff out there. Planetoids. In fact, Pluto is not, did you know this? That some guy decided not to make Pluto a planet, and he, he won his case? That's, that's rot. That is rot. As far as I'm concerned, Pluto's still a planet. Amen. 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 I, I don't care what he did. I'm Pluto's still a planet as far as I'm concerned. But see, the, the, that's truth. That's so-called scientific truth. This is where we're going to stop for tonight. 2 Peter 3, 3 or 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Last days will be scoffers. They're going to be scoffers about the Bible. They're going to be scoffers about what you believe, who created what. In the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of coming? We're waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, right? That's going to be a supernatural event. It says it's from a supernatural book. And it's going to happen. What we're going to do, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up here tonight and everybody come back. What is it, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, Brother Scribble? And we'll finish up, what is science? Oh, Brother Ed wants me to advertise again. I can't read that one part. But he says, oh, burningbrightministries.com. That's uh, my website. And what's that other one? Go. I don't have my... Go gospel. gospel. Oh, yes. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ he wants me to give give the gospel. Okay, I will do that. I'll do it real quickly. But uh, burningbrightministries.com. That's where my website is. And those that are watching on Beetle, we'll go on Beetle uh, and look at Burning Bright TV. But uh, we do want to talk a little bit about the gospel. We'll take about thirty seconds. The Bible says, "For all sin and come short of the glory of God." And to those who are watching. And you realize there is a God out there, and if there's a God, then you, uh, and he's a creator, then he makes the rules. And he says, for to come short of the glory of God. You've broken com commandments, everyone has, everyone in this room has. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the reason why you need to get saved is because it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, not just death. But death and hell. The Bible says, And whosoever is not found written in the book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, that's all supernatural. You can't see that. But it's real. It's real. Yeah. You ask anyone in this room, this is real. You cannot tell, a, a blind man cannot tell a man that can see that he can't see. Mm -hmm. and you might be blind, but if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, by faith, you can be saved. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose the third day according to the scriptures. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can't tell a believer who's been born again that he can't see what I Because you're blind. The Bible talks about you being in darkness. And uh, we can see it. We can see it. We know it. Like I said, we're in Christ. We're sons of God. But as many receive him, to them become, uh, to many, to as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. Can't beat that with a stick. So if you're in sin tonight and you're and you're wondering what, what to do about it, the Lord Jesus Christ has the remedy for you. He died for you. He loved you. He died for you. And if you receive him as your Savior, you can be born again and you can have eternal life. And you live with him forever. Pastor, if you want to come forward and kind of close us, if you wouldn't mind. And then we'll be done. Appreciate everybody coming out. Come out tomorrow night. I got more fabulous videos. Okay, we're going to finish up Science in the Bible, and then we're going to talk. Actually, I've got videos. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the systems of unbelief and the systems of unbelief. And you're going to see why the, uh, I'm going to define pantheism, polytheism. We're going to show what went wrong. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Galileo tomorrow, and uh, we'll have a few more little videos, so it's going to be uh, pretty interesting. I, I, I obviously I enjoy the subject, so uh, I try to get as many little videos and things in as I can to keep it interesting. But uh, yeah, and of course you saw the introduction of what we're going to talk about through the rest of the, 
the rest of the competition. Amen. So after, uh, we're really going to get into the more nuts and bolts, you know, tomorrow night, and then obviously all day Sunday. And a lot of introduction uh, tonight, a lot of just laying a foundation about certain things. So, I mean, we're going re to really start getting into now the different belief systems that are out there, which is really the key to the whole thing. Yeah. I, was, I mean, science is a belief. Amen. Uh, Darwinism is a belief system just like Christianity. That's all that it is. It's, it's just a belief that Darwin is right. I mean, that's all that it is. It's, it's a belief system. Uh, so again, it'll really start getting good, uh, even, uh, not good, not it wasn't good tonight, but a little more in-depth with comparison. I know what folks were looking uh, for that kind of a thing, you know. Field tonight. Right, right. Tonight, again, it's just, you know, it's like most of these things are, you know, you start with the introduction, get you un understanding terminology and what some things are, and uh, really going forward from now, getting into Galileo and Darwin and, and that sort of things and these different trials and, and all, but I know that that's what people are looking for. Amen. So don't think that, oh man, no, he didn't get into anything with Darwin tonight, or he didn't get into Galileo tonight, and this and that. It, it, we'll get there. Amen. We'll get there. We saw him tomorrow night, and we have three times on Sunday. Amen. So he's still, he's still got five more time periods. All right? Five more, 45 minutes or so uh, time periods. So again, uh, if you did not get, there should, you should have two handouts tonight. Now again, that, that's all that we went over tonight, and that's expanded stuff. So go home and read that stuff. I mean, the introduction uh, is about eight pages long, and then the other one is about five pages long. So read them. If you did not get both of them, see me, and I'll make sure I, you get a copy. All right? So you're going to have eight, hand, eight handouts, one probably all together. At the end of this thing, seven or eight? Seven, seven handouts it's going to be. All right? Uh, so just make sure you have uh, one of them. Amen. Before we leave. All right? Let's have a word of prayer. And uh, if you got questions about Dean's, uh, feel free and then to bombard him uh, afterwards, all right? Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you for the foundation that was laid tonight, Lord, about science, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for science, Lord. Obviously, you uh, instituted science, Lord. You are the first scientist, Lord. I thank you for the, the design, Lord, that you had for the, the maker that you were, Lord God. And, and I thank you for all the things that you've given up to us that we can observe, Lord. And, and see, Lord, your handiwork, God. And I just pray, Lord, that you know, these next few nights and days, Lord, would strengthen our faith in the Bible, uh, strengthen our faith, Lord, in you as our creator and sustainer, Lord. And I just pray, God, that you would just be with those, uh, Lord, that are skeptical about these things, Lord. I pray you'd open up their heart and mind. Lord, I pray for those that are watching uh, on the Internet, Lord, for others that will get these DVDs, Lord, and, and audio CDs, Lord. I pray that it would do a great work, Lord God, uh, for you, Lord, till you come again, Lord. I thank you now and just uh, dismiss us and be with us as we go. Lord, bring us back here once again tomorrow evening, Lord. We ask you all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.